Welcome to Autism ADHD TV. It is the place to be for parents and professionals. I'm your host, Holly Blanc Moses, the mom psychologist who gets it. We dive into all kinds of important information like behavior, social skills, and learning. All right, let's get started. Welcome, Casey Waugh. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited that you're here. We are going to talk about your five things professionals need to tell parents. So you and I first connected over a TikTok video that went viral. It was so good and so touching. And again, I'm, you know, I, yes, I'm a psychologist, but I'm also a mom of two differently wired kids. So I have been before professionally and personally, I mean, hundreds of IEP meetings. Mm -hmm. um, that really was about what inspired your video was that you had attended an IEP meeting that morning. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I work at an approved private school. So every kid who goes to our school has an IEP. Um, I don't attend all of them, but this was one about a little guy who it's in our preschool program. Um, and, you know, IEPs can be especially challenging for those little ones because this is like the beginning of everything. You know, they're just starting school. And then you have these meetings with all of these professionals and administrators kind of just rattling off information and going through the motions. And his mom um, kind of just, she, she held up her hand because we were on Zoom. So we're all, uh, you know, watching each other. She held up her hand and started to talk and she couldn't get the words out. And she started to cry and she had her tissues and she was, you know, wiping her eyes. And I'm an empath. And I was like, I was starting to get teared up because I can just, you could tell that she wanted so much for her son. And she just wasn't, the overwhelm was just, sitting on her shoulders in that, in that meeting. Um, so that after that meeting was over, you know, we talked to her, we, we encouraged her, we told her, you know, this is, this is not all that your son is, you know, I made sure to say those things. And the other people on the meeting also were, were encouraging her and telling her all the good things that her son could do as well. Um, but after that, I thought, you know, I work at a pretty awesome place that we are able to take the time and do that. And we, make sure that our parents feel um, empowered. But I, you know, some parents don't have that. Um, and I just, again, I'm an empath and I felt really, really like emotional after this meeting and it wasn't even my kid. So I just kind of like sat and I thought like, what do I want her to know? Um, and so I just wrote it out and I started to just film myself, didn't intend for myself to cry, but I just was thinking about it. And I think that that just resonated with a ton of people that IEPs are hard and they suck. Um, and just know that like, you're not the only one who has ever cried in an IEP meeting, but you don't get to sit in other people's meetings. We do as, as professionals, we go through so many, but parents, you get one a year. Um, and you don't know what the person next to you, you know, the next meeting, what that parent is feeling. So just wanted to bring attention to the fact that, you know, parents, you're not alone, even though it may seem like you're on an island, you know, you're really not. I so. love that so much. And it, it was just such a beautiful video. So we'll just make sure to also um, link to that video as well. So that way people mm -hmm. can see it directly. So Casey, you're a pediatric occupational therapist from Pittsburgh, woo -woo, me too, yeah. <laughs> with nine years of experience helping parents support their kids through daily life. Your passion is to elevate parent confidence through education and community because every parent and every child deserves a safe place to belong. I love that. And you're right, a lot of times parents do feel so alone. And I know I've felt that way definitely as well. So let's talk about these five things professionals, including you and I, need to make sure that we tell parents. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Number one, you are the expert on your child. Tell me about that. Yeah. 
So I think, again, thinking about an IEP meeting or really anything, you go into a doctor's appointment, anything with someone who has a degree that you don't have, you think you have to kind of take the back seat and just take whatever they tell you when in reality, yeah, they have expertise in one area, but you are the only one who's ever raised your child. You're the one who is with them 24 hours a day when they're little, maybe, you know, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you see them the most and you know them the most. Um, and so that means that you, you have your own expertise and it's very valuable. So especially in these meetings, when people have their, their piece, you have a huge piece to give. And that's, what you see at home that these people don't ever get to see. So remembering that you are the number one expert and also the number one advocate for your kid is super important to remember. It is really important to remember because, you know, especially when you have a differently wired child or, you know, in in any case, our, um, my specialty autism and ADHD is I still believe, even though I've been, you know, doing this for 23 years, I still believe the parent every single time is mm -hmm. the expert because they are, they know their child better than anyone. And I've also been on that other side where professionals have, as, as the parent, professionals have maybe tried to tell me that I didn't know something or, you know, it's like, what, what? No. Yeah. You know, I know, I know my kids better than anyone. Um, mm -hmm. So really remembering that even in those moments where maybe they're telling you, you don't, mm -hmm. or maybe saying that, Hey, you know, you're doing this, you know, or doing that. And yes, of course, as parents, we need to stay open. We want to understand, we want to educate ourselves, you know, all of those things, but really making sure that it's ultimately your based on what your knowledge is of your child and the information you gather. And it's, you know, really about your decisions too. Mm -hmm. Right. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that's a, a good point too, that, um, you know, we can take the information from professionals, but um, at the end of the day, the recommendations have to sit right with your values and what you want for your child and what your dreams are and all of that. So you ultimately do have that power as the parent to kind of make choices about which way you go. Um, so your expertise also comes with that decision-making um, ability and just being strong in that confidence that you are going to make a smart decision and that you have the right to say no to a recommendation, you know, again, stay open-minded and yes, these people have expertise in their area and they're going to give you recommendations, but, you know, taking it all in and sitting with it before you make a decision, just because someone tells you to do it. Um, just remembering your, your expertise and your values and what you want for your child in the long term. Exactly. Okay. Number two, you are an integral part of the team and your voice matters. Yeah. Um, I was telling you before we kind of started this that the TikTok had a lot of comments on it. Um, and one of them stood out so vividly to me. Um, and this mom said she was not allowed to attend her child's IEP meeting because there were too many people on the phone call. <laughs> and I was like, I couldn't go back to find it because there's too many on there now. And I wanted to like reply to it and be like, I'm pretty sure that's not allowed um, because you are like legally you as a baron are part of that IEP team. Um, and there are situations when, you know, you can say you can't attend or something happens and, and, you know, sometimes people can't come to meetings when they're supposed to, but you know, that you are just as important at that table as the school psychologist or the OT or the special ed teacher, again, because you are an expert on your child, but your voice is equally as important too. Um, as professionals, we might do X number of IEPs in a year, but this is your one um, and your voice and what you want to share is, it should be equally as loud and equally as listened to as the other people around the table. Um. To the person who made that comment, <laughs> that is outrageous. Yeah. Um, so 
you know, uh, also I, I love that you said that um, when you were thinking about who needs to be there and what that also, you know, may look like is if you want as a parent, if you want particular people to attend, you know, you can request that as well. Mm -hmm. And if they say that's not the time we have for the IEP meeting, you can always say, then we're going to reschedule it for another time where they can right. come. So, you know, your voice does matter. Absolutely. And I love that we're talking about this as far as professionals need to tell parents because oftentimes they don't feel that way. And I don't think professionals, um, I don't think most professionals at all are, are trying to make that kind of environment for that parent. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think so. But I do think that because like you said, they attend so many and, and professionals are, they're so busy, right? They're, ex mm -hmm. they're exhausted and they're trying to fit it in. And maybe that comes across in a way that they don't really mean it to. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we do as professionals need to always, always include those parents, because again, they are the experts in their child. Now, whether you are an educator listening to this, a mental health therapist, an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, um, these are all things that we need to remember. And when I'm doing um, work with my patients uh, as a therapist, always including the parents, as mm -hmm. much as possible, because they are that they're on that team, really, the child is number one, always, mm -hmm. right? N number one, always, no matter what, if you're talking about in school, if you're talking about in therapy, if you're talking about any kinds of situation, they are number one. And then I think comes the parent, and then mm -hmm. the other supports coming into place, when we're talking about you know, those voices. So of course the child first always. Yeah. Um, but I do think a lot of times, and I'll hear that from other parents where maybe, you know, that child goes back into therapy and there's not a lot of communication between the therapist and mm -hmm. that parent. And, you know, um, depending on that child's needs and everything that, that may be set up in a certain way for that, for that individual child. But again, no matter if that is, via email or separate, you know, sessions with that parent or a check-in at the beginning and the end, whatever that looks like, you really just want to make sure that that parent is heard. Mm -hmm. And I know, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm at a school where I, you know, an approved private school runs a little differently than a public school. And, um, you know, if you're a contracted therapist, maybe you don't have the time, like you literally don't have the ability to attend IEP meetings because of time and money and which is unfortunate. Um, but I think that where, is where it comes as professionals that it's your, your responsibility, even with parents who may not be like, Hey, like let's talk every other week kind of thing. You still need to be proactive and communicating what you're doing with the kids because you never know where that parent is. Maybe at that point in time, they're not able to respond to you right away, but that's still our professional, like ethical responsibility to be in communication, at least, you know, as, as much as we can, that's realistic, but as parents too, knowing that if you want to have a specific schedule of communication, or you want things to be done a certain way and getting more updates, you can also ask for that to be in the IEP and say, I want to have written communication this many times a quarter or something like that. You have that ability to, to add that in. If you want something like that, you can ask for it. Um, I think that's, I think that's really important. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. And again, maybe a therapist, um, they come out to the waiting area or because of COVID, you know, come to the door. Um, but don't hesitate. If you want to speak with them, if you want to um, more information about what they're working on and how things are going, please don't hesitate as the parent to ask for that. And as the professional, that's our job to make sure that we're, we are doing our part. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Number three, professionals need data and scores, but these things do not define your child. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, this was like the big thing that I wanted to hit home with that TikTok because a major part of IEP meetings is sitting and talking through scores and all of the things that um, are hard for your child and where they are behind their peers. Um, and it may seem like, oh my gosh, all they are looking at is the negatives. But from a, you know, from a, an objective perspective, numbers speak louder than saying like, he has a, high, a hard time reading. You know, we need to have data and we need to have numbers to support what you and the professionals ultimately want is that specialized education or that extra support. We can't just say they need it and start it. There has to be hard proof and those numbers are how it, how it comes out. So it is a really hard part of the IEP meeting, um, especially if you didn't ask for or receive it ahead of time, which you should, you should get a copy of the IEP before the meeting. Um, but if this is the first time you're seeing it, or seeing these numbers like percentile ranks and, oh my gosh, his age, he should be doing this and not that. It can be like gutting um, if you haven't, if this is the first time you're seeing it. So I think that that is, you know, those, those scores are not your child, but they are needed to get the supports that your child needs. Um, so reframing kind of how you look at those scores um, can be helpful. And also when you get that hard copy IEP, um, it's yours, so you can write on it. So just write all of the wonderful things that your kid can do right in the margins there. Um, don't forget that the scores are important, but these are all the things that they can do um, because there is a section for strengths, but it's in a different part on the IEP. So in that moment of the meeting, we're just talking about this is where he's behind. This is the score. This is what isn't working well. And this is why we need to support him. But it can just be, I think that's a part where, where it gets really... Um, hard, I guess. It does. And, and like you said, that information is really the foundation to be able to provide the service in the first place that the child needs. But then when you hear those scores and, you know, again, like you said, typically we'll see these many words or typically we're going to see this independence or typically we're going to see this type of academic work or uh, social skills, but it can feel like you said, it's just so hard to hear because that parent may also be, you know, hurt, you know, just hurting and thinking, did I do this or should I be doing this? Or, you know, all those shoulds that can come in too. And when you're referring to numbers, that also has a lot to do with mental health therapists, as well. And of course, in, you know, outside of school, all the same stuff. So for instance, if I'm doing um, an evaluation of a, if a parent comes in and says, you know, I'm interested to see if my child meets criteria for autism, and I'm doing that evaluation for them, and say it comes back that that is the case. Um, that does not mean that your child is not amazing in a thousand ways that doesn't make them less, mm -hmm. right? So if they meet criteria, they meet these check boxes, that does not make them less at all. They are beautiful the way they are. It may be that some things are easier for them and some things are maybe harder for them. And so we're going to support them in all of these different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I know you know, personally, when um, some like working memory and processing speed scores and things were coming back um, for my own children, it's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, and you, you realize how hard that can be, you know, mm -hmm. for them to do these things that are expected of them in school. And oftentimes curriculum, they're just not built for children who have these learning differences. Mm -hmm. um, in these executive functioning differences. So it can be really hard and you can, you can grieve that, you can have concerns, but be careful not to stay there for too right. long because then it can blind you to all the other amazing things they can do and all the things that we can do to help support them. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on to number four. You have rights. <laughs> I love that so much. Yeah. You have rights. And, you know, again, there is the legal side of IEPs, due process, 
you know, all these things. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I think sometimes as professionals, we feel like, are we allowed to tell parents like, you know, you don't have to agree with this or something. But I think that again, going back to the fact that we live in this world and we deal with this a lot, but this could be a parent's first time experiencing this. So they, they need to know that they do have rights. They have a voice and they're able to contest what is put in front of them. You know, hopefully it never comes to a point where you have to file a complaint and go through the courts and things like that. I really hope that that doesn't happen, but knowing that you have the law on your side, um, can be really important and helpful in those situations when they say, sorry, you can't attend your son's IEP meeting. You say, no, excuse me. Um, I can, and I will. Um, so at the beginning of the process, you, you should get the procedural safeguards, which are just those like legal rights that you have. But it kind of reminds me of when you get like a HIPAA form at the doctor's and it's in like six point font and you say like, okay, yeah, whatever. And you sign it, but you should receive that. But knowing kind of like going through that can be hard. Um, so basically my advice, I'm not here to give legal advice at all, but to, to kind of sit with that and look through it and actually know what parental rights are in the law. Um, if you do have concerns, um, it's just empowering to know that, again, you have something to back you up um, and it's called the law. Um, <laughs> and I think one of the things that is um, super powerful that we kind of, again, just sign because it comes at the end of a meeting is what's called the prior written notice. Um, and at the end of an IEP process, you get that document that says, yes, I consent or no, I don't. Um, and typically it's like given either right at the end of the meeting, or maybe it's mailed because we're virtual right now, but that document is kind of your ability to say yes or no. Um, but also outside of IEPs, the PWN is also what you can use to either, well, the school has to fill that out and document whether they are making any kind of change to the educational system. So if they want to make a change, they have to tell you. And that's where the prior written notice comes from. But if you request something and they just verbally say, no, we're not going to make that change. Um, that's all well and good, but you, you also have the right to ask for that in a PWN. So then it's documented and they have to prove why they are denying you what you are asking for. So that PWN is something that um, is super powerful as a parent to know that you can request changes. They can say no, they have the right to say no, but they also should give you in written documentation why they're saying no. So um, a website that I really like is understood.org. I don't know if you've ever heard I of that one. I like it too. Yeah, because it kind of breaks these things down in very simple, like easy to understand chunks. And they'll walk you through, like, if you have a dispute, here's what you can do as a parent. Um, and I have referred parents to that. And I've also, you know, told parents, because I am at an approved public school, sometimes parents will come and tour or they will do X, Y, and Z to try to advocate for their child to come to our school. Um, and I will say, you know, you have, you can get an educational advocate or you can look up this kind of stuff. So even though it seems like, are we are we allowed to tell them like they can, they can have disputes, but it's really just educating on the rights of what parents have, because it's, it's something that isn't um, easily accessible, I guess, but it's a really, really helpful tool to know that you've got that in your toolbox if you need it. It really is. And I feel like that's, like you said, it puts, you know, professionals in sort of a strange situation where if I go with one of my patients, I can easily tell them, you know, you don't have to sign that mm -hmm. <laughs> too, but I'm not a employee of the school, you mm -hmm. know, so I can understand how that can be a little bit confusing and not quite being, not quite sure what to do, but I think it is good practice. It's the ethical thing to do. If a, if a parent is unsure about something, them knowing that they don't have to sign this, they don't agree, they can put in the notes that they do not agree with this mm -hmm. at all. And making sure again, we always say document, document, document. That yeah. is incredibly important. Um, also, when you had mentioned, as far as having an educational advocate, I am a big, big believer in having somebody with you. It's an IEP is already so stressful. 
right? Yeah. And there is something so important about having somebody there that understands your rights, that is familiar with your child, who understands the school system. Um, even though I have been to hundreds of IEP meetings as a professional and then lots of <laughs> them as a parent as well, um, I always have an advocate for my kids. Mm -hmm. And I have them attend because what if I am feeling emotional, I'm sort of wrapped up in the things and I miss something, mm -hmm. right? Or maybe I didn't think of everything. Maybe there was something that, you know, I didn't think of in that moment that that educational advocate did. Mm -hmm. um, so again, just something to think about. There are free resources for that or you could hire someone, um, but there are lots of educational advocates out there mm -hmm. um, in your state. So really be thinking about that for sure. I know in my group, um, Autism ADHD Facebook group for parents, we are really lucky to have six powerhouse um, educational advocates in there. And they're mm -hmm. a big part of the group and they're always jumping in and, and helping parents and answering their questions. So. You know, it, it really is um, an important thing to know that you have the right to bring mm -hmm. someone with you. Right. Okay. And just because you bring someone with you doesn't mean that you're like ready to go to war or something, you know, oh, just to support, no, no. you know? Yeah. 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 And I, I'm glad that you brought that up because it definitely was not my intention. No, um, I know. But, I just think it's like people think, parents think like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't want the school to think that I am, you know against them or, or I'm going to disagree or fight. It's, it doesn't, you are allowed to bring someone with you, you know, a spouse, a partner, a friend, even if you wanted to be emotional support, but educational advocates are a wonderful resource that you can and should take advantage of, even if you are on good terms and you agree with it and you have a good team. Um, it's not a negative. Definitely. And I'm so glad yeah. that you brought that up because I, I have had lots of parents tell me that they would love to have someone there, but they're afraid the school would um, not want them to bring someone. And again, you know, it's not about attacking the school. It's not, I mean, it's nothing like that at all. It really is for you and your child. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really about making sure that those gaps are filled in. Again, if I don't remember something in that moment, or I don't think I, I'm, you know, no one is a hundred percent knowledgeable on everything. Right. And so yeah. how wonderful would it be to have someone with you who does specifically this? Um, they're yeah. not the parent, they're not, you know, a, a emotionally involved um, and they can be really helpful. And I find that when I bring an advocate for my children, um, what I really love about that too is that they create even a better team, mm -hmm. I think. And mostly the professionals, the teachers, the other therapists at the school, they are really open to that. Right. Um, and I find that it actually is, is really quite helpful. So I'm excited about uh, sharing that information. Mm -hmm. So right. last but not least, right? Number five. You are your child's biggest advocate, but you don't have to do it alone. Yeah. Yep. And I think, well, we kind of talked about that just right now there with the educational okay. advocate. <laughs> yeah. But I think, and also, like you said, with social media, it can be um, really helpful to find parents who have similar situations, whether they are in your school district or across the country. Um, so even if you feel like you're the only one who's experiencing this, maybe you're the only parent of a child with a specific diagnosis or need in your school district, you're, you're not the only one in the country, you know, so finding those resources online um, can just give you that community that you might not otherwise have um, and know that there's other parents who are figuring it out as they go, just like you are. Um, and I think you know, when it comes to advocating, again, I think our kids can um, learn a lot about advocating for themselves by watching how parents advocate for them and standing up for their, what they feel like they need. Um, and I'm a big believer in mom gut. Um, when something doesn't feel right, 
you know, listen to your gut and stand up and speak up for what you, what you want and what you need for your child. So definitely. And I, I definitely believe that as well, that, and it goes back to even number one, that you're the expert, Mm -hmm. right? You are your child's biggest advocate and you modeling for your child. And so what we did for our oldest son who is autistic from the very beginning, like if you're not, if you don't want to attend, that's absolutely fine. You let me know Mm -hmm. what you want me to say for you. And then it also got to the point where he felt comfortable telling me and then writing it down. I wrote it down for him and he checked it, you know, to make Mm -hmm. sure that I had everything in there that he wanted me to present. Um, at one point he felt comfortable coming in and reading what he wanted to say and then immediately leaving, which is absolutely Mm -hmm. whatever works for him. Um, and again, we having them be a part of all this helps us be even a better advocate. And Mm -hmm. also like you were saying too, is you don't have to do it alone. And sometimes it does, it feels like, you know, we're nobody else gets it because we're surrounded by people who maybe don't have that parenting experience that Mm -hmm. you do. And it can feel very alone. You can feel alone in that. I actually had stickers printed out. You are not alone. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I I hadn't told you that. Yeah. Uh, Because I, and I give them out to people and, you know, saying that you are, you are, and remember that. And there are community groups, like you said, there are, you know, different ways that you can get support as well. And you can advocate, but also get that support that you need as a parent. Right. So yeah, you're asking for help and, you know, we want our kids to be able to ask for help when they need it, but we have to be open to asking for help too, which is hard. It's hard to, um, it's hard to do that, but it's available. You might have to do some, um, some searching at first, but it's there if you look for it. Definitely. Oh, that's so good. And I think again, yet another great reminder that parents need to hear, um, from professionals and, Mm -hmm. you know, us seeing how we appreciate their advocacy, um, as professionals, um, and acknowledging that, you know, wow, that's, you know, you are really putting all this together, you know, you have taken such big things, right? I mean, it can feel really big when you're pulled in a hundred directions and, you know, it can be really overwhelming, but also letting that person know that, look, you, you've done all of that. And, um, also there's help too, you know, Mm -hmm. when you need it and providing some helpful resources. Right. That's awesome. So Casey, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, I'm so happy thank, to be here. Thank you for your TikTok video. Uh, I started <laughs> crying because I oh my gosh. feel it. Feel every that song minute. also, just anytime I listen to that song, I'm like, oh, I just cry. So <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. And so what we're going to do is let everybody know again, how they can find you because you're on social media and you're sharing Mm -hmm. such great information. Yeah. So I am on Instagram, um, and TikTok OT time Casey. Um, and then I also have a Facebook group and a YouTube channel. Um, and those are OT time with Casey. So, um, on YouTube, I kind of do more long form stuff, you know, really get into the nitty gritty of sensory processing, what's sensory processing disorder, how do you help your kids sleep with sensory processing, those kinds of things that take more than just a 30 second clip to talk about. Um, But Instagram is where I hang out the most. So I'd love to see you join me there. I will definitely put links in there because I know people are going to want to find you and learn Mm -hmm. from you. I know I've really enjoyed um, your Instagram, especially. Um, Great, thanks. You're welcome. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, and also I'll make sure to have a link because we were talking about getting those supports. I'll have a link below <clears throat> for my group for parents on mm-hmm. Facebook. Who that's just such a beautiful and supportive group. 
Um, also, I have a group for professionals mm -hmm. uh, who specialize in autism and ADHD and how they want to learn the most effective and efficient ways to uh, support children. And um, we've got oh, occupational therapists in there, speech therapists, mental health therapists. We've got a, a lot of amazing uh, professionals in there too. Great. Yeah. I just joined that group. So <laughs> yes, we're so I'm yeah. excited that you joined. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, you, will you come back and chat with me again sometime? I would love to. Perfect. Uh, thanks again, Casey. And I'll see you next time. All right. Thanks. See okay. ya. Take care. Thank you for joining me today. Don't forget to click that subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like this episode, please share it with someone. It may just be what they need to watch today. If you're a parent, I'd love if you came on over and joined our Facebook group, Autism ADHD Group for Parents. If you're a therapist or educator, come on over to our group, Autism ADHD group for therapists and educators. You're going to find those links right down there in the notes. Thanks so much. And I can't wait to see you in the next episode. All content provided is protected under applicable copyright, patent, trademark, and other proprietary rights. All content is provided for informational and educational purposes only. No content is intended to be a substitute for professional medical or psychological diagnosis, advice, or treatment. Information provided does not create an agreement for service between Holly Blanc Moses, Crossvine Clinical Group, the interviewee, Holly Blanc Moses, LLC, and the recipient. Consult your physician regarding the applicability of any opinions or recommendations with respect to your symptoms or medical condition or the symptoms or medical condition of your family member. Children or adults who show signs of dangerous behavior toward themselves and or others should be placed immediately under the care of a qualified professional.